guys and welcome to my channel the journey to justice and don't forget to like share sub to my channel and press that bell so you can be notified on upcoming events so let's get started and we are going to talk about the Megan Feromoska as you know, the police released affidavit from the events leading from the 12th of December up to the arrest of Megan. And of course we know that the affidavit only says so much, it's not going to tell us everything, but it's going to give us a little insight of what the investigators did find, what they do have, and what they may have. And they will not release absolutely everything, but they are just giving us a little taste. And, you know, some of our suspicions... It, you know, to what could have happened, what did happen, how it happened. Well, we know some things happened, um, but we don't know how she did it. Like, how she got her from her home, from Heidi's home, to her home. But obviously, we feel that she gave her something a drink and it put her to sleep because we just don't know how it how she ever you know let Megan get away with murder so guys we're we'll start with the unsealed affidavit reveals what may have happened to Heidi on that fateful day, December the 12th. Just two weeks after the birth of her baby. Now we'll just go before the birth as we know that on the 26th, around that time, Megan came down to Austin to spend some time with Heidi as she was going to go into the hospital and have her baby. Now, at this time, they gave Megan a key to their apartment and Megan was supposed to leave it in the apartment before she left to go back to her home 150 55 miles away and they could not find this key they never did find the key so Megan had a key to their apartment While she was in the hospital, Megan inserted herself to be like the center of attention. She was overheard speaking to Heidi about how many weeks pregnant she was. And the nurse in the room stated that she overheard her saying, she was 37 weeks pregnant. But they were due around the same time. I'm not sure exactly what due date Megan had, but it was around the same time. It seems like Megan was mirror in her from the time she was pregnant 
she took Heidi's advice, she probably watched videos, you know, how are you feeling, she's probably feeling the same, you know, all those kind of things, like a chameleon, exactly how she was. So, Heidi had the baby, and in the room was, you know, Heidi's father and mother came in to hold the baby, and well, I think it was Heidi's father, the grandfather was holding the baby, Megan wanted to hold the baby. And this was the first time that he held the baby and she was trying to take away his glory. The feeling. But Megan was thinking, hell no, that's my baby. That's my baby. See, she wanted the glory, she wanted the feeling. She didn't want anybody holding that baby. Sounds like she may have wanted to be the first one to hold the baby, other than the mother. Because we know now that she felt that she was the mother and that was her daughter. Now we already know she felt that way. And suddenly, she disappeared from the hospital without saying goodbye. Apparently, it's like she just vanished from the hospital without a word. So, Heidi goes home. I don't know if Megan spoke to her in between. Um, I guess she did. And the weeks went by and Heidi's mother went home and it was her first day out with her child and the baby taking her oldest son to the school. And while she was there, she went to the book fair and bought three books, which cost $25, as we know, because Shane kept on saying that. And so the books cost $25, and she could not wait to get home to read them to him later on. So, in between the time she went to the book fair, um, Shane and her talked, and this was around quarter after eight in the morning, and then somebody else texted her, called her at 23 minutes past 8 in the morning on the 12th of December. And I think Heidi may have called somebody else or texted somebody else. But when they tried to get back to her later, her phone was off. But I'm not sure if that was another friend or that was Megan saying that. I'm not sure on that part. But... As we know, Heidi was heading home, and she got home, she must have got home and went into the apartment, but not for very long, because Megan showed up, Megan showed up on surveillance, or, well, was seen around nine o'clock. So did Megan just show up? Or did Megan make arrangements to meet her? Hey, I'm just heading home. I'll be there in a minute. Okay, I'll meet you there. Oh, and Heidi was seen walking to this car on surveillance and plus a neighbor saw them. There's a couple of neighbors that had um, seen what was going on that morning on the 12th. 
Um, so Heidi was seen walking towards this car and this girl got out of the car and greeted her. Now there's conflicting reports because, you know, they're sitting at the front of the car, but they didn't say if they're sitting in the driver's side or sitting in the passenger's side. And Heidi was getting into the back seat of the car. So it might seem like there was three people in that car, two at the front, one at the back. But I think there was only Megan and Heidi in that car. Um, a witness said her getting into the back seat, but she must have not put the baby in the car seat because it seemed that she didn't have time enough to put the baby in the car seat. So she may have been holding the baby in the back of the car because they drove off too quick. What I'm thinking is Heidi may have thought she was coming down to see Megan's baby because apparently Megan had her baby on the 8th or the 9th and nobody had seen any photos. She hadn't even sent photos to Heidi in text or nothing. So what do you think about that? No, because she didn't have a baby. But Heidi and Shane must have thought that was, you know, pretty weird. Not to have called them and said, hey guys, I've had my baby come and see me. You know, overjoyed, it's her first baby. Nothing nothing and then Heidi must have thought yay I'm gonna see the baby and when she went into the back seat of the car and got in Megan might have shut the car door and put the child locks on and put the locks on the window so you know child proof windows and Heidi couldn't get out of the car. And then Heidi was realizing there's no baby in the car seat. Even if there was a car seat in there, there was no baby in there. Unless it was a doll, a faint doll looking like a baby. And then when Heidi went to look, she noticed it was a doll. Yes, guys, that could have happened. But I'm feeling like if there's child locks on this car, which there probably is, and Heidi couldn't get out the car and she couldn't wind down the window for help, and, or, well, I'm just thinking that's probably how it happened. But I was just wondering how she got Heidi all the way to her place without her being sedated. So maybe they just drove along and they went and got coffee. And boom. Whatever she put in her drink knocked her out. And that's kind of my opinion on that, on those events. What do you think, guys? But, um, she said at one point she told her ex-boyfriend, Chris, who owns the home that Megan lives in, that she was going to the beach that day with a cousin. But Chris didn't see the baby until the next day on the 13th. So where was Megan from the 12th to the 13th? 
how long did it take her to drive 150, 55 miles, two hour drive or so? It seems like the time scale, it seems like she took for hours to get home, for hours. She didn't go straight home. On the 13th, Christopher said that she told him, oh, don't be mad, don't be mad, but there's a baby on the bed. And this was on the 13th. She had gone and had the baby, went into labor, and didn't call him and tell him she was going into labor. Well, they lived separate lives, so I guess she didn't have to tell him. But in the meanwhile, they were talking and getting along. He even felt her stomach but not her bare stomach, just over her shirt. And he said the stomach was hard, but it's not like he got down and put his head to her stomach to listen to the heartbeat. And remember this, guys, he's never had children, I don't think. He doesn't know what to expect. He doesn't really know nothing. He's just going by what she says and when did she start becoming a liar a big fat liar at that compulsive liar a disgusting liar a murderous liar why did they split up why did they split up in march and they were going to go their separate ways. But in March, they were going to split up. And suddenly, Megan says she is pregnant. And so Christopher's thinking, ay, 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 now she's pregnant. What do I do? Well, it's my baby. I'm going to take responsibility. Because he sounds like he's that type of guy from what we know so far what we know so far we can't know if he's lying or what but he sounds truthful and so he let her stay and they lived in separate rooms he went his way she went her way she I'm not sure if she had a job or what she was doing but he had a job and he just went about his job. Now, there's this guy that was friends with Megan, worked with her, and went out with them a few times, quite a few times, and they seemed like a normal couple, you know, while they were out, and he says Megan didn't want no children back then, but that was back then, and he hadn't seen her for a while. But as soon as they finished, you know, Megan said she was pregnant. So this was very dishonest of her. Um, she's trying to trap the man into believing she was pregnant. But the thing is, we don't know if she was pregnant. She may have been telling the truth, but I doubt it. But just give her that little if, that little if. Maybe she lost the baby. Okay, she lost the baby, but if she loses the baby, she loses him and she loses the comfort of living rent-free uh, by the sounds of it. So, the affidavit, you know, obviously starts from when Megan came to the hospital, Heidi had her baby the first day out where Heidi took her son to school and the surveillance and 
having the baby. Megan, um, who is reportedly to be a close friend, a bestie, and Heidi called her her bestie. And they've been friends since the age of around 11. And and they met up a church camp with several other friends of Heidi that are her friends today. And they have also spoken out on their relationship together, Megan and Heidi. But the thing is, the police have been busy. They've been busy interviewing people, house to house, apartment to apartment, looking at surveillance and talking and taking interviews with the people who live in the complex. Now, I said there must be surveillance there. There must have been somebody that saw something. And they're not going to find their odd until the police come knocking on your door. Knock it. Knock. Knock. We have some questions to answer. Questions to ask you. Well, anyway. They find out after, you know, they discuss things with Shane, family members, um, Heidi's mother, and they find out about Megan. But really, they're looking into Megan because once they got that surveillance, they must have asked Shane, do you know this person? And Shane must have said yes. That is Megan. Now, when Shane went on the news, and then he got, um, he was so nervous. He didn't want to do it. He said he didn't want to do this. He didn't want to do this. He was so nervous. We was like, what, why is he so nervous for? He, he felt awkward. Now we know about the surveillance. I'm thinking that he was asked to get on this um, this news channel and say whatever he had to say. And he, he was surely making himself look a bit guilty. He surely was. Because many people have got on the news, acted the same way, and have been found to be guilty. But I think they encouraged him to get on there and make himself look a bit guilty so they could take that away from Megan, not focus on her so much. And even Megan said to the police that it's Shane that did it. He's the guilty one. And she and she told the police lots of things about him. You know, abusive, he's this, he's that. And it's what Shane said in his interview. It sounded like he knew who it was. You know where I live drop her off, drop him off. I'm going to be at home in the next few days. So you know where I'll be. Drop it off. Just drop it off anywhere. I don't care where you drop it off. Just drop it off. And talking like that, and we're like, who's he talking to? Is he sending a message out to somebody? Because that's what I thought. That's what I said too in my other video. Is he sending a message out to somebody? And... Well, apparently, I think he was. He was. Because he was angry. He was mad. And he couldn't say a word. So, the surveillance that the police were doing, um, they were getting a warrant for her mobile phone, her internet, whatever they were doing. Her GPS. Where has she been? Where have the pings been? They got a warrant for the pings. And they were doing all this before they arrested her. They found out that Megan conducted suspicious internet searches. 
and was in Austin area at the time of Heidi's disappearance. And, and like I said, Shane was telling them about her coming down, have the baby in the hospital, and the nurse overhearing that Megan was 32 weeks, and and that she more or less took the baby away from the grandfather because she wanted to hold the baby and and that he told them that Megan would leave the key in their apartment when she left but him and Heidi could never find the key they never found the key and Shane told the police that on the 8th or the 9th um, they had learned that Megan delivered a baby girl but didn't see any baby pictures. Now that's for a bestie. For a bestie. You've just been to your bestie's a birth and you didn't share your birth with her? That's what a bestie would do. According to the affidavit, a person who lives at the same apartment complex as Heidi had video camera outside of his residence that captured a ve vehicle consistent with Megan's car driving the complex around 9 a.m. on December the 12th, the same day Heidi and Margot went missing. One witness said that on December the 11th or 12th, she saw an adult white woman at the apartment complex carrying a small baby and walking towards a parked car. The witness reportedly told the police she then saw another woman exit the car and greet the woman carrying the baby. The two women and baby then entered the car and drove away. On the December 19th, the witness was presented with a photo lineup and Megan was in that lineup. Police said the witness was 60 to 70 percent positive. The woman she saw in the front seat of the vehicle at the apartment complex was Megan Firomuska. And this is where it might get a little confusing to some people that she saw her in the front seat. Well, the front seat could be the driver's side. So people's thinking there is three people. But there's only two, as far as I can tell, how I see it anyway. Upon further investigation, officials found Megan conducted suspicious internet searches. Police said Megan reportedly searched for reasons for an Amber Alert and Amber Alert issued in Austin. And that was on December the 12th. A full review of searches between November the 11th and December the 18th revealed that some form of Heidi was searched at least 162 times from a device using an account that lists Megan Firamuska's name. So guys, as we thought, as the FBI, the police involved in this case, knew she'd be watching, knew she'd be searching, but she did it on her own account. 
and that can be traced. Did she not think that? She never thought far enough ahead that you don't use your own devices. But anyway, it's a good joke she did. Mm. And we're happy that she did too. She left breadcrumbs all the way to her home. And on 14th of December, Megan allegedly searched bodies found in Austin. According to the affidavit data from T-Mobile, so she was on T-Mobile, revealed that Megan's phone was in Austin area near Heidi and Shane's apartment on December the 12th. Authorities then began conducting surveillance. Yes, they did. On the Houston area home where Megan lived, and the home was owned by her ex-boyfriend, Christopher. And officials said they found her car parked in a way that appeared to be an attempt to hide it. Yeah, well, when we see that on the national news, the helicopters, who parks their car like that? You had to, like, it was tight to get in there and who does that well somebody that has to hide something they don't want nobody finding like a car and a body hmm. alleged because remember she is innocent until proven guilty in the court of law but not by the public and our opinions and speculations and that's how I see it she hid her car and we all know why because there was a body in the car in a duffel bag parked in the backyard and I just want to know is didn't Chris ever go out there for any reason? Didn't he even go out to the garage that's at the side? It doesn't look like it gets a car parked in there. It's used for storage, it looks like. But he never drove his car all the way up the driveway, obviously. He may have just used the front door all the time. But he never went and sat in the backyard any time. Well, perhaps he doesn't. He's a busy man. Because maybe he would have smelled a fell odor. But he has not mentioned he smelled anything uh, yet. And it just seemed to me that um, if Christopher is um, cleared of all wrongdoing, which it doesn't look like He's made statements, he's been into the police, he's been released, he's been questioned, and he was a person of interest. It doesn't look like he's a person of interest anymore, but he is um, willing to answer questions. I don't think he lawyered up, and if he did, I think he's answering the questions because if he is not guilty of anything, then he's going to answer the questions. But I think he's going to be a prosecutor's witness against Megan. And that's how I think he's going to be. But guys, if he's cleared of all wrongdoing, you got to feel a bit sorry for this man. But I just wonder why he didn't notice anything. When did be, she become a liar? Did he believe everything she says? 
didn't he notice her appearance like she's acting crazy she's acting weird she's lying is he a guy that just don't take any notice of those things he don't really pay her any attention I mean they must have communicated in some way didn't he see anything wrong with her acting in a strange way that he may have thought well this must be what goes on when you're pregnant you know your mood swings or something like that you know did he see any difference well he may have but that's not going to come out yet that's going to come out in evidence in court they're saving uh, a lot of things that he has said in his interview but you got to feel a bit sorry for him. He's been cheated on. He's been lied to. He's been used and abused mentally. He thought that was his baby. He was going shopping. He was buying clothes. He was buying food for the baby. He was loving on the baby. And he started getting close to that baby thinking that baby is mine. And he got attached to that baby. And now it's all taken away. He's got to be feeling some kind of loss. But not a loss knowing it's not his baby. But a loss of him thinking he was a father. And, and the feelings that he had. Maybe he didn't really want to be a father. But once the baby come, you know, it got to him, it, it got to his heart. And she's taken that all away from him. But you know, he knows it's not his baby. It's been proven not to be the baby. And I'm thinking he's feeling like a sucker right now, been duped by a con artist. Now, there's got to be something, well, we all know there's something mentally wrong with this woman to do such a thing and to a bestie at that. A woman, a girl, Heidi, a friend that only loved on her and loved on her friends and friends for a long time, that you could possibly think of doing that to a friend, but do that to anybody. Now there was a word out there that she was selling a baby crib a long time ago maybe she was planning on abducting somebody else's baby but it didn't pan out because she had to have a baby that kind of looked like her kind of the same race and do you know what I mean guys she had to get the right baby she had to get the right woman and I don't know if anybody is coming forward to say that they answered this ad maybe they have but the police won't be telling us that if they have and it just goes on doesn't it and she has just planned this from the beginning once she knew Heidi was pregnant her plan went into action how did she not stop herself from doing this because she's mentally ill and she wanted what she wanted or she wanted to take away she had revenge she had hate she's very selfish and according to gossip or facts out there that she may have not had a very good childhood but that's no reason to take your bestie's baby and kill the mother or take anybody's baby and plan this but she may have been abused sexual abused abused there's secrets in the family, guys. There is secrets in the family. And a lot of people that do 
murder, rape, assault people have had some kind of abuse in the family. Now it looks to me like she's been a troubled kid. Um, it doesn't look like she's been in trouble with the law except for these tickets that she had recently. And maybe when she started getting into trouble, maybe that's when her depression of bipolar set in. Whatever's wrong with her. She need to be on psych meds. And we don't know if she ever was on medication or not yet, guys. Maybe she was on medication at one time. She stopped taking her meds. I don't know. And so we're probably going to find out about her mental health, her childhood. But that's not going to be released. That's going to be sealed. And it looks like the FBI closed down her account and got into it um, with a warrant and shut it down before the public could get a hold of it. Um, or it was already shut down and because according to uh, um, the stuff out there she started to shut down her accounts isn't it funny how people start shutting down their accounts yeah they do it all the time they start shutting their accounts down when they're going to they want to disappear or fade away and they don't want people knowing where they are their location because getting on social media and sending messages from your phone it sends out your location it sends out your location guys and so Facebook can track you. They're not really tracking you personally, but when they're asked by the FBI and have a warrant to get in your account, yeah, you will be tracked. And they will find you then, where you've been, what you've been doing. And they can go back since you've been on it and look for small details, what's been going on, when, what happened. Um... So, you know, on this day, officials followed the owner of the home and interviewed him. Apparently, uh, they watched Chris leave the home because they had surveillance on them. For some reason, they got a court order and they were getting warrants but they had to watch them for a little while and they followed him apparently he was in Target he was getting baby food he was looking at baby clothes and when he came out he was interviewed by the officials and they showed him a picture of a baby and this picture was Margot Heidi's newborn baby and this man, well, this man, as we know now, was Chris, said he thought it was the same baby in his home, living in his home. Now, remember, this guy's got clothes. He's looked at the face. This shows that this man paid attention to this baby. And he had seen this baby quite a few times because he said it looks like the same baby. That's the baby at my house, he told the police. So this just shows you he got close to this baby and paid attention to the baby's features. He then explained to the officials that he and Megan had broken up in March and that he had never seen her bare stomach during her pregnancy. The man added that he noticed that Megan's stomach grew 
during the year and that he did fill her stomach, which it described as being hard. Yeah, according to the affidavit, the man believed that Megan was pregnant with his child. It's a shame in it, all around. Megan allegedly said that on December the 12th, she left to go to the beach with a cousin. Now, I wonder if they ever spoke to any cousins. Uh, you know they did. You know they did. Because they may have the cousin's name, but they're not going to release it. When uh, Megan saw the man she was living with, which was Chris, on December the 13th, so she didn't see him until the 13th. So this is looking like either Chris didn't come home on the 12th or Megan didn't appear until the 13th. She told him, don't be mad, don't be mad. That's when Megan told him there was a baby on the bed. Megan allegedly said that she went into labor and delivered their baby without the man's knowledge. She reportedly told the Texas Ranger that she went into labor on December the 12th. Of course, you know, they know she's lying but could not remember the name of the birthing center in which she reported giving birth at. Now guys, if you've ever had a baby, you went into labor, you sure would remember where the hell you went, what time it was, when the labor pain started, when you gave birth, you would remember everything and it's your first baby. And you wouldn't want to be alone. You wouldn't want to be alone. Well, that's because she never gave birth to a baby. And when she couldn't remember the birthing center, where it was. And she added that the only people present during her delivery were the employees at the birthing center. Well, fancy saying that. Why didn't you just say you gave birth at home? But you know, we know all births have to be registered. Births, deaths, and marriages. It's a legal document by law. Uh, so where is it? Well, this birthing center didn't exist, did it? Well, it did, but she was never there. And December the 19th, officials searched the home where Megan was living. According to the affidavit, when the investigation and investigators arrived, they smelled the unmistakable odor of decomposing flesh and it was coming from the trunk of a vehicle parked at the back of the house. And it was Megan's car. This is why I said, didn't Chris smell it? But then again, he's in and out the house. He might have thought if he did smell anything that it was road kill or a skunk, I don't know but maybe he just didn't smell it at all. Now you got to remember the FBI, these investigators are well seasoned. They have been in this situation lots of times. They have been to death scenes. They have been to, you know, found bodies that have been buried. They're used to it. They have, that's why once you smell 
a decomposing body, you will never forget that smell. And you will recognize that smell for the rest of your life. But these investigators have smelled that smell a ton of times. And the body later reported to be Heidi. The body was shoved into a duffel bag like trash, left to decompose, as we know. That's what bodies do mm. uh, when you have died. Uh, Megan abducted Heidi by restraining her and preventing her liberation by holding her in a place where she was not likely to be found, especially inside a black duffel bag in the trunk of a parked vehicle. Megan's attorney, Brian Erskine, released the following statement Monday. Attorney Jackie Wood and I were anxious to review the evidence collected thus far and have many of the same questions you do. Those accused, as well as the public at large, understandably want swift and certain answers from our criminal justice system. We call upon patience and resistant to rush to judgment until all the facts are in. The information contained in recently uh, released probable cause affidavit is nothing more than mere allegations. As with every American accused of a crime, unless the state has proven these allegations beyond any reasonable doubt, Miss Megan Vera Mosca remains innocent. Yes, guys, she remains innocent and too proven guilty. But she's in the Travis jail awaiting her day in front of a judge and that will come on the 3rd of February. It has been delayed for certain reasons whether prosecutors defense and it was Christmas it was the new year but she is not going anywhere and they weren't in that much of a rush, but there is a certain time you have to legally charge somebody with something. But right now, she is charged with two counts of kidnapping. And um, tampering with a deceased body. And that penalty alone, if found guilty, she could get, you know, 40 to 45 years in prison for that alone. But we know, in our own opinion, that is the public's opinion, in our own opinion, we know that she is going to be charged with more than that. Now, her, her offense is going to be upgraded soon, but when, we don't know. She could be charged with first degree capital murder, kidnapping, and could face the death penalty. Now we don't know what the charge is and what they're going to charge her with and how the lawyers are going to handle her case, but these lawyers that she have now are able to represent her if this case becomes a death penalty case. Um, 
So here are some news clips and little refreshes, also the full affidavit. Now I will put it up and go slow, stroll down slow, but if it's not slow enough for you guys, you can also stop the video and read it and move on. And so it's there for you to read. I'm not going to read it out. It's it's quite long. And there's a lot of, you know, details in there. And so it's best that you take a little read of it and enjoy and thank you for stopping by guys and don't forget to like share and sub to my channel and press that notification bell and let's have a discussion leave your comments after the video and what's your intake on the case and how do you think it's gonna go now there might be people out there that feel that she is innocent. Yeah, innocent. But there are people out there who think that she's definitely mentally ill somewhere along the line. But that doesn't give, but she's um, capable of standing trial. I don't think she's that mentally ill. She has um, depression. Maybe she's miscarriage. Maybe she's bipolar. She must have always been bipolar. I just don't know how you just get bipolar. But, and she obviously's got issues. And if you take a look at her photos from, you know, a year ago, two years ago, some picture of her with Heidi, you look into them eyes and you look into the eyes of Megan today, the day she was arrested, her monk shot, her eyes are dead. The life has been sucked out of her and she looks a mess. She has a lot to worry about and it shows all over her face because she knows She's only 33, so she knows her life's over and she's going to spend just about the rest of her life in prison. And she is on a $600,000 bond, which percentage of that, she's not going to make bond and I doubt if anybody's going to give it to her. And she should never get born because she's a danger to herself and others. So guys, I'll see you in the comments.
one of her children at Cowan Elementary in South Austin. Investigators believe she returns home at that point. She doesn't pick up her child from school, so her fiancé, Shane Carey, calls family, friends, and police. Friday morning, Austin police issue an alert and release their pictures to the media. Over the weekend, police conduct interviews, look for surveillance video, and enlist the help of federal authorities. On Wednesday, December 18th, Investigators set up a tip line for information. The next day, December 19th, a tip leads them to Houston. KVU's Bryce Newberry tells us what happened there. That tip led authorities to a home in northwest Harris County and eventually to a woman connected to Heidi Broussard's murder. Her name is Megan Fieramuska, and this is where she was taken, the Harris County Jail, on two charges of kidnapping and a charge of tampering with a corpse. This is Megan Fiera Muska, the woman arrested in northwest Harris County at this home. Investigators found a body in the backyard in this silver Nissan's trunk. Police say they found Fiera Muska outside the home Thursday and detained her on traffic violations. Megan Fiera Muska? Fiera Muska appeared before a Harris County judge Friday, keeping her head down most of the time. When police connected her to the Broussard case, they added kidnapping and tampering with human corpse charges. Our cameras were rolling as Fiera Muska left the Harris County Jail, bound for Travis County, where sources tell KVU she could face a capital murder charge. I've been following that her story as being, you know, having been missing and thought, what in the world could have happened to her? And oh, Lord Jesus, is she in our backyard? Darla Bundick lives down Bojack Lane from the home where the body was found. Yeah, I never would have thought in a million years it was this. Late Friday, the Harris County Medical Examiner's Office identified the body as Broussard's. They ruled she died of strangulation. Meanwhile, investigators are running DNA tests to confirm a safe, unharmed baby found at Fiera Muska's home is Broussard's daughter, Margot Carey. Law enforcement sources tell KVU Fiera Muska plotted to take baby Margot leading up to her birth and 